I would say that the topic today is probably one of the hardest topics that we could talk about. Because when we look at our fathers, or we look at ourselves, we don't measure up. There's things that we should have done, or things that they should have done, that we could look and we could blame them, or we could blame ourselves. We could say that I didn't know what I was doing here, or I failed in this area, and... and being a father, being a parent, is under God's hand the most biggest, the biggest responsibility that we have, and it's also the hardest, because when we have these kids, and they're just little bundles of crying snot, <laughs> what do you do? Taking this kid home from the hospital, and you have your whole life ahead of you. And God has given you the responsibility to train this child up. Many of us are kids ourselves. We don't know what we're doing. We don't know what to do. But God has given to us a child. A child to train a child to equip and a child to love. And hopefully when that child turns 40, 45 years old, he leaves the house. <laughs> but you know, that child is you. When I look at my life growing up and my dad, what he had done, I, I said, man, I'll never do that. I will never say that to my child. Right. Then I get to be my age, I said, man, I sound just like my pops. I say the same thing, I act the same way, I look just like him. I am a mini-me of him. What do we do? Most of us teach and train and equip our kids the way that we were taught and trained ourselves. And sometimes we look at that and we say, well, that's not the right thing, or that's not the right way to go. And what we have to do is we have to look at this is who I am. But the scripture gives us some insight. Many times we'd ask, somebody would say, have you had the talk? Have you had the talk? Uh, I want to tell you what the talk needs to be. The talk of the birds and the bees is very important. But the talk of godly principles upon their life is paramount. Unless our kids can understand the truth and the principles of God's word, when they walk out of our door, they have not been biblically sound enough to make those decisions. And we get on our knees and we pray before God that they will make that right decision. But yet we look at our own life and we know they won't. Because I didn't. When I was 18, when I left my parents' house, when I had the opportunity to make that improper decision, I did. Because I wasn't taught the, the principles of God's word. So what do we do? I believe there's things that God has taught us. The wisest man in the Bible has given us simple principles that we as dads and as parents, if we put these principles into place, we have these kids for a short time. And these kids are not ours. They are God's. God gave them to us to train and equip, and then they are gone. What do we do with these years that God has given these kids to us? Many of us have been on our knees. Many of us pray for our kids and ask our kids, ask God to bless our kids and allow our kids to be safe. But I want to give us a couple principles, not about keeping our kids safe, but training our kids to be safe. Because I truly believe it's a very big principle. Not only to put our kids into a cage where they have to obey us. I believe it's very important that we open that cage and allow them to understand the principles of life. So when they do fly out of our home, they understand the principles of life. Not just, oh, I hope it's okay. I hope they don't make it trouble. I hope they don't do anything wrong. I believe it's the foundational principles 
But so let's look at Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4, we're going we're gonna to just do some dissecting of some scriptures. It, it's a wonderful text, uh, Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. And uh, Solomon, the wisest man in the Bible, has, has come back and he's looking back at his life and, and how his father David has given him some principles to live by. And he says this, Hear, my children, the instructions of a father, and give attention to no understanding. For I have given you doctrine... Not for, not, do not forsake my law when I was my father's son, tender and the only one in the sight of my mother. He also taught me and said to me, let your heart retain my words and keep my commandments and live. He's talking about two principles, wisdom and understanding. He said, when you're tender, when you're young, when you can be formed, teach. Example. Kids will emulate their parents. Little boys are going to emulate their dad. Little girls are going to look for somebody like their dad. So what we must do is at a very early age, teach them to understand the word of God the doctrine of God, understand and train them so when they hear the word of God, they get wisdom and they make those choices. I truly believe it's sometimes it's hard to do, but I believe with kids, we must be close enough to them to allow them to fail, but close enough to them to rescue them when they fail. I believe it's very important for our kids to make those mistakes and to let them know that you are going to be there to love them through those mistakes because if our par parenting skill is one that are so encaged that we will never allow them to branch out we'll never allow them to go anywhere when they do get out and i we have seen this many times under a very protective lifestyle when they get out they go out they don't experience life when they're under your roof, so they're going to experience everything they can. And when they get out of your life, and I guarantee you, that rebellion can be miserable. We must love our kids enough to teach them, to love them, and to allow them room enough to make some decisions. Not major decisions, but decisions that when they leave your house, they have a wonderful understanding we, they need to listen, and they need to retain some teaching. We can talk to them. We can teach them. We can yell at them. We can tell them everything in the world. And they're going to retain some of that stuff. But when we live our life in front of them, communicate to them, and allow them to move, allow them to do certain things, they will retain through our communication. You know, it is saying that uh, dads in a normal household spends two minutes a day of direct communication to their children. Two minutes a day. And then the parents give the school and the church the responsibility to train up their child. And when the child makes a mistake... Instead of the parents taking responsibility of their mistakes, they blame the school or they blame the church. We're well, the first place that we have to look at. If I engage my son or my daughter for two minutes a day, it's not the school's responsibility. It's not the church's responsibility. God gave our children to us. And what we must do is we must take an interactive program, uh, approach of training, loving, and teaching our kids, wrapping our arms around them and let them emulate what we do. We were taught an example by our fathers. But if that example that was taught by our fathers was not successful, what we must do is we can't just take the crutch and say, well, that's what I did. That's what my dad did. What we must do is we must go back to the word of God and say, what does God want? What does God want? We must listen. And it says, do not forsake my law. In other words, the things that I teach of the word of God Teach them, lovingly teach them so they see the truth and let your heart retain my words. 
and keep my commandments. You know, I love when it says, let your heart. As we've talked about many times, out of the heart goes the issues of life. Guard, protect your heart. So when you're talking to your child, do you know what you're trying to talk to? Are you trying to talk to their head? Or are you going to try to talk to their heart? If all we're doing is teaching, 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 telling them, yelling at them, directing them, they're going to get to their head. But when you get down and touch their heart, that's where it's going to stick. When we talk to our kids, every kid is different. Every child is different. We must train up a child in the way he will go. We have to understand our children, understand them in a way that they are going to be uniquely different. They're not going to have a rubber stamp and do exactly the way you want to do. They're going to make you upset. They're going to make you frustrated. It's going to be time you say, God, what am I going to do here? What we do is get on our knees before God and say, God, I need wisdom. I need understanding. I do not want to react in a negative manner. I need to have wisdom so I can act in the proper manner. Just like what our kids are going to do, we must do. We must get on our knees before God and say, man, I've got this 8-year-old, 10-year-old, 12-year-old child, and he's making some stupid decisions, and he's taking this path. You, we could yell at him all day long, and I do believe we should control some things within his life, but we must get on our knees before God and say, Lord, teach me. Teach me Give me wisdom. Give me understanding. Allow me to communicate properly. So I am not condemning, nor am I condoning. What I'm doing is motivating, loving, communicating, touching his heart, knowing what the principles are, the word of God are, the doctrines will be. So the first thing we need to do is listen and retain my teaching. And then the second thing, acquire wisdom. And when we get wisdom... We get understanding. Acquire wisdom. Verse 5. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her. And she will preserve you. Love her. And she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Uh, when we're praying for somebody... The first thing that we ask for is their wisdom. That they make the right choice. They do the right thing. When somebody is wise, it's not intellectual wisdom. It's spiritual wisdom. It's God-given wisdom. What do I do here? I haven't been trained in this area. But when we ask God for wisdom... Be wise. Lord, I don't know what to do. I need your wisdom when it comes to my children, or it comes to my life. And we plead with God. We get his wisdom. Supernaturally, what we understand is we get understanding. Not only I know what to do, but I understand how to do it. And when we're talking to our children, we're talking to our kids, the hardest thing to do is when we have to hit that brick wall. And I don't know if you guys have strong-willed children. Anybody have a strong-willed child? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'll tell you what. Strong-willed children are very difficult. So when you try to hit a strong-willed child with a strong-willed dad, what happens? You can't, you can't cuss in church, but all something breaks out, right? So what happens? It just, it just butts head, butts head. And what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? And you're on your knees before God and say, what do I need to do? We need to say, Lord, I need your wisdom. And we have to attach our doctrine, our love, and our direction on our knees before God to attach his heart. And when we can talk to somebody and we can get deep within their heart, and know that we love them and we want them, we have to love them through it. And then sometimes they are going to apply what we have taught them. They're going to do what we ask them to do. But sometimes, just like you and just like me, they're going to say, Dad, I got this thing. If I need you, I'll call you. And they'll walk out the door. 
what do I do? How, how do I handle that? How do I handle that? We have to remember they're gods. And just like the prodigal son, he came to his father and he said, I'm sick and tired of your work. I'm sick and tired of everything you're making me do. Give me what I have. Give me my money. Give me my inheritance. So his father, broken, heartache, said, okay, I don't want you to do this. But he gave him what was due him. The prodigal son went and lived a hellacious lifestyle, and he, and, he, and he spent all of his money doing everything he wanted to do. But his father was looking and praying, saying, oh, I wish my son would come home. He gets on his knees daily asking for God to protect him, to love him, to honor him. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 16 that the son came to himself, in other words, he heard the prayers of his father, the direction of the Holy Spirit. He came to himself and he humbled himself and he said, I am going back to dad. Because dad left the door open. And sometimes when we have a hard, uh, a hard willed child, strong willed child, sometimes we need to understand, I love that child. I'm going to leave the door open. I am not going to break down that barrier. I'm going to love him. I'm going to pray for him. I'm going to keep him close to me. I need to pray for wisdom. I need to pray that he gains wisdom. And getting that wisdom, I must have understanding. Our kids may not be just like us. Our kids may not do what we want them to do. They may not say the things that we want them to say. But you know what? Our kids are vessels of God. What we must do in a very early age when they're tender and young, we must teach how to pray. We have to teach how to get wisdom. When they are old, when they leave our house, when they go on that date, when they go out of town, when they go on that college trip, you can't be a mom and dad that goes on every trip with them. You can't control everything they do. You may be at your house and you may be wringing your hands. I hope everything's okay. I hope everything's okay. I hope everything's okay. But what we have to do is we have to pray that the things I did for them and with them while they were young stuck into their soul and stuck into their life. I, I love being a, a coach of younger kids, uh, not so much older kids, but younger kids. I, I like coaching and teaching some athletics and I use this analogy a lot when I'm talking in counseling. Um, I have a parent that's, a, that's a, maybe a basketball fanatic or a football fanatic, and, and uh, he's a terrible dad, but he loves sports. And uh, I just say this. I say, you're a coach, and you have a child that has never played sports before, never walked on the basketball court, never walked on the football field, and you have a game in eight weeks, and he has no idea what a basketball is. He has no idea what a free throw line is. He has no idea what a 10 yard line is. He has no idea what a field goal is. He just, his dad and mom's making him play football or basketball. Your job is to teach him. You have eight weeks. He has eight weeks to train that child so when he gets out on that football field or that basketball court, he doesn't embarrass himself. He knows what he's doing. And that's a task that coaches have. And many coaches do a wonderful job with that task. But it's the exact same task parents have. God has given to us our children. And that child is ours to train, to discipline, and to equip. When that child turns 18, the game is on. Our job is to make sure I have taught my child the rules of life the principles of the game. So when that child steps into the game of life, he knows what he's doing. He knows what it means. It may be difficult. He may not be an all-star, but he understands the consequences of issues. He understands when he fouls, somebody else gets the ball. He understands when he steps out of bounds, somebody else gets the ball. He understands there's consequences to every rule. And in life, 
Athletics is the only instantaneous consequence that they will ever achieve. You can break the law. You can do all kinds of things. You could lie, and you can get by with everything. But in athletics, when the referee blows the whistle, calls a foul, and he looks at you, and he gives the ball to the other team, you can do this all you want. You can yell at him all you want. You can cuss at him all you want. But guess what? He still blew the whistle. He still called the foul, and the other team's still getting the ball. But sometimes in our parenting, your child gets in trouble at school, and the teacher calls you. Sometimes it's not the kid's fault, huh? We start yelling at the teacher. We call the principal. But we do find out that our kids made a mistake. In parenting, our job is to train, equip, and love. We have to acquire wisdom because it's very difficult. Solomon is saying, listen, above everything else, ask God for wisdom. Ask God, what do I do? How do I do it? I have this child, and this child's giving me problems. Or this child may be perfect. I may, I may have the best child in the world. He may be smarter than me, more athletic than me, more spiritual than me. How do I handle that? How do I encourage somebody to go better and higher than I am? Ask God for wisdom. Ask God for understanding. Ask God to direct you, whether they're smarter than you or more challenging than you. The awesome thing is that God gave him to you. Ask God for wisdom, whether it's negative or positive. Ask God for understanding to take my child to the next level. Sometimes our kids go through all kinds of stuff, whether it's at school, whether it's their own personal life, whether it's their own identity, or whether it's physical challenges. We look at our kids and we say, Lord, take it away from him and put it on me. I, 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 want, I don't want him to go through this. I would be more than willing to have it put upon me. But God is saying, I need you to go through this with him. I need you to be who I need you to be with him. We need to get wisdom. And by getting wisdom, we get understanding. The understanding aspect is the how-to. The how-tos. I don't understand it. We get on our face before God and we struggle every day. We don't know what to do. So the best thing that we can do, as Solomon said, is ask for wisdom. Not dictate what they do. There's a time when they're young that we have to train them to dictate what they do. But there's a time in their life when they are getting ready to branch that if they have never made a decision, they're not going to start making the right decisions when they're 18. If they haven't made a decision when they're 13, 14, and 15, we need to allow them room to fly. We need to open that cage and let them fly because they have the ability. They know what they're doing. If we have done our job, we need to pray for wisdom. We need to pray for understanding. And then wisdom exalts honor. Listen to verses 8 and 9. It's talking about wisdom. Exalt her. And she will promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. She will place on your head an ornament of grace and a crown of glory. She will deliver to you. Talk about wisdom. If you exalt wisdom, and will, wisdom will promote you. Wisdom will bring you honor. And when you embrace wisdom, wisdom will place you in the head of an ornament of grace and a crown of glory will deliver you. Wisdom. Asking God. Say, Lord, I don't know. I don't know what to do. I need you to direct me. If we can do that in every area of our life, in every situation that our child goes through, every situation, we, every situation that we go through, say, I don't know what to do. We don't have to be superpower. We don't have to be super dad. We don't have to say, I know what I'm going to do here. Sometimes we just say, dude, I don't know. I don't know. Can we pray about it? Can we talk about it? And just like 
in relationships. What's the pros and what's the cons? What does the Bible say about what we should do? Because when we make every decision through wisdom, through God's word, we don't make mistakes because we take God into account. And when we act with godly wisdom and say, you know what, I want to make sure I do what God wants me to do, let's pray about this. And a child that's six, seven, eight years of age, when he sees this one event, it changes the way they perceive God. You know what that one event is? A dad on his knees, praying by name his child, asking God to bless that child, asking God to keep that child, admitting to God and admitting to his child, I don't know what to do. I know you do, God. I ask you to put your hand of protection upon him, to love him and to help him. I believe this generation of children, they need dads that are authentic, that are real, that are humble, that are godly, and that want to train their children to see God at a very early age. But it takes authenticity. It takes realness. It takes somebody that isn't full of pride, that could admit failure, that is not so controlling that they have to do everything that I tell them to do, but it takes somebody that, let me show you what God wants us to do. Because when those kids walk out of our house and they go on that date or they go to that party or they go to college, we're not going to be there. <laughs> and we may stay up all night long and we may wait till they get in at night and we may talk to them to make sure they're not wasted. And just like what we did and our parents did to us. But what we have to do is we have to train, we have to equip, and we have to love. And we have to give our kids to God. It's hard. I believe this one issue with parenting on Father's Day is one of the hardest things. The majority of our homes, even when the dads are there, the dads are absent. And when the dads are absent, John Maxwell says this, in the absent in the absence of leadership, someone or something will take over that leadership. You take our little kids. If the dads are absent in fathering, somebody will take over as a father. It may be another man. It may be the school system. It may be the church. But it may be somebody that you don't want to have leadership and influence within our children's life. And you can't look at them and you can't blame them and you can't blame God. You can't blame the church. You can't blame the school system. As dads, it's us. We have to actively engage our kids. We have to communicate. We have to love them. We have to accept them. Whether we agree with them, we have to love them. We have to train them. We have to mold them. In most cases, and this is very sad, dads stick their head in the sand and they say this, go ask your mother. In the absence of leadership and a father, somebody will take over that leadership. God has given to this home a, a responsibility as the priest of the home to the father. You are the pastor of your home. Just like I am the pastor of this church. I have the responsibility of the spiritual guidance and the training and the leadership of this church. You are the pastor of your home. You have the responsibility as the pastor of your home to spiritually engage your kids, to pray for them, to give them that advice. Not to bully them. Not to dictate what they do. Train. Equip. Love. And pray. 
when you pray and use your child's name, it melts the spirit upon them. And the presence of God through you upon your child knows this. Dad loves God. God loves Dad. Both love me. It gives a child a sense of belonging. I'm praying for you. I want the best for you. It may not be every time, but when that child does walk out that door, when that child does go to a party, when that child is handed a drink, handed a joint, handed a pipe, what does that child do? Oh, not my, oh, my, my son. He would never do that. What will they do? What will they do? We cannot control what they do at the party. We're not there. What we can control is what we do at home when we're praying for them, when we're talking to them, while we're loving them. They will emulate us. Dads, two minutes a day. What do you think that would be? That would be a complete failure. The biggest responsibility we have is our kids. Let's use it wisely. Let's take it. Let's honor them. Let's get wisdom. Let's get understanding. Let them listen to us. Let us impact their lives. We just saw all these pictures of dads and their kids. Huh. I'm 52 years old. And I saw that picture of my dad. He died a few years ago. And you know what I saw? A picture of that 79-year-old man on the screen. I saw Bruce at 79 years of age. I see him when I'm 52 years of age. And guess what? My kids will probably not want to hear this. But they're going to be just like me. Hope they have a little bit more hair. Hope they're a little skinnier. But kids, really, it's how we treat them, how we bond with them, and how we love them when they're young, how it impacts them when they get old. Let's not ever sacrifice the greatest gift that God has given to us other than our salvation is the gift of our kids. Let us love them, help them. And if we've already broken that bond, if we've done things that they are gone. Let us do everything in our power to restore, to love, to forgive, and to move on. It is our greatest responsibility. Let's go to prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, we thank you for our children. On this Father's Day, Lord, we look at our fathers and we look at our kids we look at ourselves and we know that we can't measure up and we know that we can't do everything right and we really sometimes don't even know what to do at all. But Lord, I pray that you will give us that wisdom that you talked about. That we will humble ourselves and ask you to direct us. And after we get that wisdom, Lord, you give us that understanding of how to apply it. Just to know something is not good enough. Just to know what the Bible says isn't good enough. We have to apply it. We have to understand it. We have to use it. And Lord, allow us in this issue with the fathers. Allow us to do what you want us to do. Allow us to love our kids unconditionally. Accept them. Train them. Equip them to be prepared for the game. And that game is very tough. It is brutal. Life is hard, and we need to allow every opportunity for them to get to know you and your ways and your word and your will. So when they enter into life on their own, without any mom and dad, I pray that you'll give them the wisdom and the understanding to be successful 
to follow your word. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Pastor Al.